You're listening to Solera Innovation Labs, where automotive experts from around the world discuss technology trends in mobility and debate tomorrow's rules of the road. Whether you're a technician, a dealer, an appraiser, a car lover, or anything in between, we'll discuss topics that will keep you up to date and help you and your business win. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Don's Drive-In. Today, we have a special podcast to talk about the recent SEMA event. For those that don't know what SEMA is, SEMA actually stands for the Special Equipment Market Association. So most people really kind of know that it's SEMA, but that's what it stands for. And, and with us is Kristen Felder from Collision Hub. Welcome, Kristen. Hey, thanks for having me, Doc. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you were available as we you know, concluded the SEMA event a little over a week ago. And I thought it would be really cool to kind of give our listeners a little bit of information about the event and what happens there. I mean, everyone talks about SEMA, there's APAC, there's all sorts of stuff going on, CIC, there's all sorts of acronyms of events that, that happen there. And I figured we'd talk a little bit about it and then really go in, dive in a little bit, Christian, to what Collision Hub did there and some of the things that you see. So uh, if, as I walk through this, if there's something you want to interject about the show, please help, help feel free to help out. Uh, because I think, again, everyone wants to hear what's, what's going on. Not everyone gets to go to the show, so I think it's important uh, to, to kind of talk about this. So as I walk through the event, one of the things, and Kristen, you probably spent a lot of time there, is that they have the sky bridge between these halls. And if you have not been to SEMA's convention center or the convention center in Las Vegas, it's it's huge. I mean, it's just unbelievable how many miles it feels like it is. And so they have this big um, sky bridge between the, the, south, the central hall and the south hall. And what they did this year, and they kind of do it every year, is they set up the new product showcase uh, on that jet bridge did you spend any time over there Kristen, looking at some of the stuff they have yeah the, the media center is right in the middle of that sky bridge um so it serves as home base for us kind of throughout the week so we're constantly in in and down that hallway that's awesome so as you walk through there and we'll, we'll spend some time just because of the new product anything as you walk back and forth on there that you went oh wow this is really innovative or unique okay. to to our industry you know, I think as you walk through that, you always see something that go, you go, oh, wow, about. It's a little overwhelming because you've got everything in there from performance parts to collision repair to, you know, refinishing. It's one big hall of innovation, which is kind of inspiring and, and a little overwhelming sometimes. This year, there was a lot of software that was coming in as technology. You know, the SCRS had their, um, what used to be their guide to, their guide to estimating that was a paper copy that they turned into electronics. Evercoat was back again with a color-changing primer. That was very interesting. So from a collision repair perspective, everything in that hall really was driven on shop performance, which was nice to see. Well, and, and you know what? I think that's, that's kind of where the focus has been when we talk about OE procedures and the direction of the quality and integrity of following those in the repair process. You can start to see that the industry starts to understand that we've got to build solutions to kind of enable that, right, and, and guide them down that path. So some of the other things that's kind of cool about FEMA in a week, one of the things that people don't realize is all the different events that go on. So one of them that stood out to me because I'm part of CREF, the Collision Repair Education Foundation, it's really about training that next generation, is that the Hot Rodders of Tomorrow, which is a, is a group that really kind of pushes. And they actually did a, and I don't know if you walked over there or spent any time with it, but they brought in high school students from around the, the U.S. to build engines and test their skills in a competition. And with this competition, they gave away millions of dollars of college scholarships. And I think that's just something awesome. Did you get a chance to see that at all? So that's a longstanding tradition for SEMA. And they used to have that out front. So right in front of the North Hall. And those kids would be out there all week. And it's almost like the pit crew of engine building. So they're building engines. They're timing how long it takes them to build the engines. And then they also have student day where there are hundreds of our future technicians come in and get a chance to see the show, meet their heroes get some training and some career advice. What SEMA does with that is amazing. It is truly amazing. So you have that going on at SEMA. Then if you're out front and if you ever get a chance, and for the people that have been there, they see this every year you see smoke as you come close, just coming up <laughs> off the ground. And you wonder what the heck this smoke is about. And you get there and Ford takes the front parking lot of that hall and they do nothing but give rides to, with other performances, be it a Raptor truck, be it a, a Mustang GT, they are out there just ripping it, uh, doing drifting, donuts, spinning, and people can get out there. And it's just kind of a cool thing to take a look at their performance vehicles. And you spend any time there. Did you even take a ride this year? Yeah, uh, it's been a couple of years since I took a ride. Last time I did, we were doing some drifting stuff, and we had Kim Block out there. But I didn't do well after I got out of the car. So that was, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't do well on roller coasters and those other things. I don't know what I was thinking. 
Um, but well, yeah, Ford, Ford expanded their Raptor experience this year, and they've got a new school you can go to. If you buy a Ford Raptor, you're eligible to go what's called the Ford Tactical School, where they will teach you tactical driving, military tactical driving techniques with your Raptor. And I mean, that's, that's probably your reason to buy the truck right there, but they expanded that this year, and we're kind of showing off those capabilities of the Raptor truck. 3M is also right there next to that whole display. Right. Um, so when we're out there all week doing demos for attendees, whether it's you know sanding or cutting or grinding or um, adhesives or any of the demos we were doing all week, we had to do them in the middle of four. And it's hard to get people's attention about adhesive when there's a, a raptor truck jumping over <laughs> in a barrel. And, but we yeah, and, they're, and, they're, and they're not quiet either. I mean, they really set no. these things up, right? I mean, the, the, the exhaust, the tires, the rims. I mean, these things are, you know, if you're a hot rodder, it's, it, you're just looking at this going, wow. Right. Yeah, and the tires are in the air, is what I tell everybody. That smoke, that burning rubber, is there's little black pieces. It's raining tires on you the whole time. And so, ship's back on the air this season. Overhauling's coming back. And we had put one of his cars up front, Shelby, which I believe will be probably the first episode they'll air. And about every 30 minutes this year, we're, you know, we're wiping it down because it just gets covered in little <laughs> black pieces of tire. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that's what makes it fun, right? It, you know, yeah. it's, it's cool that Ford always takes the front, but, you know, the other manufacturers actually grab different sections of the parking lot to go do similar things. And there was a Formula Drifting demonstration that was going on on the, on the east back east corner that was just really cool to go watch these guys. And, again, another ride-along you can get in. And oh, it's crazy. Fun. Yeah, I believe it was last year, Kia, and I, I may get it wrong, and I'm going to apologize, but Kia had the Stinger, which was kind of their little upgraded version of the car. They yeah. did the same thing on the opposite parking lot that Ford was doing, just to kind of prove to people that, hey, this isn't maybe what you thought a Kia should be. I mean, they were doing the same thing, <laughs> drifting people, and I was like, this is kind of awesome. I just want to go race a car and not hit a wall. We did have a few accidents this year at, at SEMA. One got national attention for a car that was stolen and wrecked the day they were setting up the show and they just brought it in the show and displayed it in this rec format. It was kind of awesome. <laughs> but it, it is kind of cool because as you walk through this and just for everyone who's never attended, you can go from the collision section to uh, stereos, to tires, to suspension, to mirrors. I mean, you want to talk about automotive accessories, floor mats, tires, rims. Uh, if you, you're in the trucks, you want to lift your truck. They got the truck section. They got the SUV section. They have, uh, the, the off-road vehicle section. I mean, there is so much to see, right, when you're yeah, there. I always tell people, you don't even have to like cars. I think after a while, some you know, some of us are gearheads, and that's how we got into this business, is we really like cars. And then we have people now in this business that are business professionals that are in it for the business, not necessarily because they were gearheads. But um, you can be anything, and you're going to find something at SEMA that you want to see, and that will impress you. So um, even if you're not the ultimate you know, car junkie, you had Hot Ride Magazine in your in your room when you were growing up. There's still something for you to think about. Yeah, no, there's absolutely. And you know what, the cool thing for me and the exciting part, uh, and, and look, I'm a car guy, so I get out and you start just walking around, even where the Ford display is in the front, and you yeah. start just walking around, there are so many cars on display. And when I say just cars on display, we're not talking about your brother's Mustang. Yeah. We're talking about Ferraris, Lamborghinis, you know, a- any kind of high-end exotic vehicle is sitting there and it's been customized from paint to wrap to rims stereos interiors it just floors you to look at the hundreds of millions of dollars worth of vehicle yeah i wouldn't even want to add up what the risk so you know that old insurance to me is wondering what's the risk exposure at team i mean how much money is here but um (laughs) but hey speaking of cars last time we talked about corvette did you get over there and get a chance to sit in it i did not you know, ah. it, it breaks my heart. You know, it breaks my heart. So you know, for those listening, I, I ordered uh, the 2020 vet, the mid-engine vet. So, uh, and it was there. And I did not get a chance to get over there because of so much things that are going on at the event. And I think that's the other thing to talk about, Kristen, is when you're there at the event, it's not just going to to the you know, to SEMA or Apex or any of the other industry associations that are there, but it's all of the other meetings and business that goes on at SEMA. So you have the spectacle of the of the show, but there's so many other things going on, right? I literally ran into people at Thursday night at kind of like the closing SEMA party for SCRS that had not made it to the floor all week. I mean, there were so many meetings in the Westgate and and, and where the, you know, the CSC panel and whatever, they had they had filled their week with that and had literally not had a chance to get down on the floors and walk around. So that always fascinates me. I, I would think it would hurt my feelings to go all the way to FEMA, be right there for a week and never get a chance to go play with all the candy and toys that are on the floor. 
Well, and it's, it's kind of a selfish reason for having this podcast uh, is simply because I was one of those this week, this past week when we were there, because I just had so many meetings. I was there for CIC and craft and some of the other things, the industry things that are going on, and I did not get a chance to walk the floors. It, it well, really, that's sure Don. I got some great videos you can watch for what you missed. They're coming out starting this week. And- <laughs> Good. And I'm, I'm looking forward to those things on Collision Hub because you guys do a great job. So let's let's segue into a little bit of that because there's so much going on and there's so many different things. And the last point I'll make about SEMA and Industry Week is that if you watch on any of the automotive channels that you have out there from All Girl Garage to, you know, like you said with Chip, they're there. Everyone's there. They're doing their own little shows, if you will, that they're filming and shooting and or broadcasting live. So anyone that you see in that automotive world that you've seen on television or on any of the social channels that you may spend time on, they're there and mm-hmm. they're there. They're approachable. They're just, my son was out there last year and, and, and Matt, uh, one of the guys that he's watched um, on social media where they, he's, he's taken some of the Subarus and really turned into because he's a Subi guy. And so no, he's in, no. yeah, he's a Subi <laughs> guy. I don't know. He's got an STI. So he's, you know, he's into all that stuff. He, damn, I got to do carbon fiber hood and, you know, those type of things. So it's just really cool. So anyone and everyone you want to see is there. But Kristen, let's let's go back and talk a little bit about what Collision Hub does there and some of the things that you saw specific to the collision industry that our listeners would want to hear about. Yeah, so SEMA is a really interesting show for us because we have our, our hot rod world and our hot rod clients and the people that are doing the TV shows. And then we have the collision repair industry and SEMA is the one time of year that they're all together, which makes it a, a little hectic. We're between all the buildings. so. We have to kind of narrow our focus when we get over into the North Hall where all the collision stuff is and really kind of make sure we're focusing on the right thing. One thing this year that was apparent that we, we noticed and a little, I don't want to say scary, but obviously there's some there's now some work to be done, was everybody had a calibration solution. So I, I would say three or four years ago, we went to SEMA and everybody wanted to talk about scanning. And this year, everywhere I turned, someone had some sort of calibration and targeting solution that they were offering to the industry. Um, kind of the next evolution, right? Is that now you scan it, now you got to calibrate it. So, okay, great, you're scanning. You know, I think more and more scanning, but they're they're going, okay, how do I how do I start to do these calibrations, right? Yeah, and that's you know, then the scary part of that was there there were some good potential solutions there, there were some good bones, and then there were some solutions that were were not going to work at all. As a collision repair industry, you know, we're struggling with proper repairs, welding, you know, the frame, structural, we're, we're still trying to get up to speed. We let ourselves get a little down on that. And then you add all this technology with the scanning and calibration. That's a little overwhelming. And shops don't know how to ask the right questions <laughs> to make sure they're getting the right tooling. So I, I spent most of that week getting stopped and, uh, and someone would run up to me with a brochure and go, I think I'm going to buy this. I would look at it and go, no, that's not what you need. Right. And so that was one of our concerns. And so we came back with that from the show. Including some of the OEs are a little confused about how calibration is going to work in body. And I was going to say that when you talk about that, it's, it, it, the OEs, I think, are still also struggling with having the space to do the static, right? Yep. And and how do you do that? Some are, are trying to figure out new solutions. So it's not just, I think, collision as much nope. as it is mechanical, both aftermarket mechanical and only mechanical, right? When you go back to the dealer, everyone's in that quandary of how do I calibrate? So you guys had a, a big focus on that. It sounds like you may be doing a, a video that you'll be launching on Collision Hub uh, simply about calibration. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, so what we're looking at right now is, is we came back and sat down and went, okay, this is a big issue. If even our OEs are confused, that's going to present some problems as, as the industry goes forward. And really, this is the one thing we can't get wrong. I, sure, I want you to put quarter panels on right. I want you to do all that. But a non-working ADAS system is, is steering. That's breaking. I mean, that's, that's, we got to get that. If car ever gets in another accident again, like per se collision wise, we could definitely still cause injury if we, if we don't get ADAS right. So right. We, we're going to have to pump the brakes on this one a little bit and do more training. So right now uh, we scratched out a, a nine part series. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. I mean, it's just the basics. I, I think shops don't understand what scanning is and isn't. It's not just looking at codes. And then after, right. you know, I got to get codes, but then after I get them, I got to do something with them. And so that was, that was a major focus coming out of yep. uh, the collision aspects of the SEMA event. And so yep. so we have that. Do you start to now kind of look over and, and look at some of the new tooling that's out there? I mean, last year you talked a lot about the Eagle system from Select and, yep. and what it provides. Was there another one that jumped out at you now that uh, be a I, welder or something along these lines that the shops need to take a look at? 
quite, you know, they, they've redesigned Eagle. So when they released it last year, it didn't quite get released for purchase and it went back into some research and development. So Eagle's back out again with some really cool improvements. And that's going to help, you know, we always tell shops, if you're not pre-measuring, you're going to miss something. So um, having really quick, affordable, but competent pre-measuring systems are critical. I mean, I can't, I can't send a car to my structural department every day and tie that up for every car that comes in. So well, talk about that for a second real quick. I mean, I know we're talking about SEMA and pre-measuring and, and one of the things you do, but when you look at, at the Eagle, for people that don't necessarily know this, or, and there's going to be some shops or, or even insurers or anyone who's listening that may go, well, okay, what do I mean by pre-measure? Because typically some people think about, all right, I'm tearing the car down and we know it's got frame damage. I'm going to put it up on the rack. I tie it down. I take a measurement and then I do my pools. So that's my pre-measurement. But that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about a car that may be even drivable. Yeah. That this tool now, by lifting it up and, and hanging a couple of targets, you can very quickly take some accurate measurements. And because of the way it's designed, I can do upper body measurements as well as just the undercarriage measurements. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's off the OE build data. That's one thing about Celeste that we like is that I think people don't a lot of times understand how fixtures are used in the process of building a car. So cool. Celeste has a lot of really good straight up uh, build data. And it's, uh, I can set up a car anywhere. Um, I, if I don't have a lift, I can do upper body measurements. If I have a lift, I can do upper, under, I can do side body measurements. Right. Um, and they're quick, they're quick, right? I mean, this is what the, the, the yeah. important thing for shops to realize is that this is something you can do. It's not going to take you an hour and a half to go do this and yeah. set it up and measure. You're talking about something that, you know, within 15 to 30 minutes, I'm doing the measurements yeah. and I can add it to my repair, my, my estimate, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we set up and measure in about 10 minutes and it doesn't take a high quality a tech to be trained to do this we can teach almost anyone to do it and we're measuring cars in 10 minutes and we actually found some cars on the same floor that have come as rentals to the show that had structural damage to them um no really <laughs> yeah, it was it was really i mean it was kind of you know you're looking at the car and he goes it's perfect i don't understand why you think you're going to measure it let's measure it anyway and then there's the problem and so we it was a good learning experience for a lot of people, but pre-measure is important. You can visually see structural damage anymore. Those days are over, and thank, no, thankfully no, no. they're over. Yeah, the old day of saying, "Hey, look, let's go look at the the gap between panels," and then can tell you if it's been shifted is is yep. uh, is is not the way to go do it anymore. All right, so we we talked about a couple of those things there. We're talking about calibration of SEMA. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, how you can do some more measurements. Let's talk about paint for a minute because I think. Yes. Uh, there's a complexity out there, and, and every manufacturer is there. Every manufacturer, paint manufacturer is there with their own booths, spraying, showing, teaching, calibrating, and they're doing all sorts of stuff. So there's a couple of things that I was going to ask you. One, color match, and some of the technology these guys have for color match that people may not know about. I mean, I, I used to have the tool in my shops where, you know, it looked like um, almost like a, a heavy barcode reader, but it's actually taking a picture of the paint and giving you the yeah. formula. And yeah. when we tested them, they were okay. Yeah, the spectrometer, right? Um, mm -hmm. But there's a lot of four stage paints that are being sprayed by the manufacturers are being replaced with three stage when you're doing it in the aftermarket. So talk, a, mm -hmm. what, tell me a little bit about what you guys saw at, at SEMA when it comes to paint. Yeah, so the manufacturers are working, or so the paint manufacturers are working really hard for aftermarket matching. The spectrometers are, are really great. You get a picture and you get a code, or, or you get a formula, but that you know that formula is not always six fifteen years ago, right? Um, so they're working really hard to make sure that we have enough variant data that it makes matching in the shop a whole lot easier. But then I think probably what you mentioned, the biggest struggle right now is, is coming up with how we're going to actually do this in the aftermarket environment. So how I paint at the factory in you know, almost a perfect situation with robots is not how I'm going to do it in the collision center. So, you know, I, I'm not going to paint the whole car again every time I have to do something. So. Right. They always are working really hard, and if that's that's a lot of science in that. Um, yeah. Confusing to, I think, to the repairers and to the rest of the world when you look at a car and go, well, okay, well, then how do, do I fix it, and how down do I estimate that? So I need to make sure the technician has the proper time to replace it. So we get that question a lot. Hey, Christian, this is a fourth stage from the factory. How do I estimate fourth stage? And I go, well, before you try to do that, how does your paint company want you to spray that now? And they'll right. come back and go, oh, my paint company's got a three-stage process. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's interesting you say these kind of things because I think, again, for those that are listening, again, if it's insurer or someone outside of just the collision space, not a shop or a painter, you know, if you're depending on if you're using a solvent, your blends are one way. And yep. if you're using waterborne, your blends are the exact opposite. Right? So it's, yep. there's a lot of these nuances that people don't realize. 
as well as the coverage of, of those types of paints. Yeah, and you there's know, colors it, that, and I always have to stop this, I love solvent. <laughs> there <laughs> is some differences between solvent and water, and, and it's not just about VOC issues. In a lot of ways, a lot of solvents have a lower VOC than some water too. But water has a crispness and a clarity to it. And a lot of times you'll have a shop or into a situation where a particular paint coat is only available in water. Um, and there's right. a reason for that. So as these colors continue to evolve, our West Coast versus West Coast, East Coast versus the middle of the country and what products are available to them. Well, it's true. I mean, you know, look, you got a lot of compliance stuff that's going on. But you know, the cool thing about SEMA is that you get a chance to, to go to every manufacturer and see how they're trying to overcome these type of things that are out there. Christian, when, when you were walking around and looking at it, there's a lot of paint manufacturers out there. And look, I've sprayed almost every one of them out there. So not one is better than the other. But is there anything that they're offering out there that's unique or different that you saw this year when you were at SEMA? No, I wish I, I wish I could say, yeah. I mean, they're all trying to push the limits of speed and productivity. Or I would say just speed and quality at the same time. You know, SEMA is the show where everybody really likes to focus on a lot of their customs. Um, and, and everywhere you go, you know, that's kind of to the forefront of the booth. And there's a very small kind of portion in the back that's really more along the lines of what we're interested in, which is, you know, painting 10 cars a day in a, in a production environment. I think right. probably one of the companies that had the best display of that, and it's a company we don't even really work with, was Exalta. They did a lot in their booth to really talk about color match and some of those challenges. They're working a lot. Everybody's got UV. Everybody's trying to do some of that. But, but um, they spent some really good time. They even had a little vending machine. It has color chips in it, so that was really oh, cool. Wow. Yeah, it is yeah. really cool. You know, anytime you can take a look, the color match is, is is the ultimate importance, not only for just the quality of the repair, but I also when you talk about efficiencies, right? If I don't have to blend a panel, it, it, it's almost simple as if I don't have to cut something apart, why cut it apart, right? It, it's that same philosophy on the paint side. If I can color match, you know, there's because you mentioned it earlier, and that is we can't paint in the aftermarket world like it's done at the factory when it comes to robotics in the right. environment, nor can we, we actually cure the paint like they do. We can't heat up the car to the temperatures they do because we have way too many things in them. <laughs> the electronics and the plastic and everything would go away. And, and yeah, that's, a big, yeah. that's a big factor. And, and it's, it's really changing. I mean, I, I just don't paint the way I used to. And there are some colors where my panel prep goes to 1500 grit. I mean, that's insane. I mean, most paint, all of my paint formulas kind of stop at the 400 grit. So, right. you know, and it's not every paint coat in that particular, you know, Buick line, so to speak. And so right. paint now and research, and it's just, it's, everything's different. Everything's harder than what it was even five years ago. And, and paint's one of the ones that's harder, so. All right. Well, that's cool. So, so I, I'm going to jump into some more questions about SEMA just to kind of pick your brain, right? So we talked about paint. We talked about measuring. We talked about scanning and, and calibration. Let's talk about some of the things that are going on on the repair side when it comes to maybe rivet guns or those tools. You know, the, the one thing that's interesting to me is that as you look at all these certifications and all these programs, every manufacturer has a, a different tool you need to go use. And the industry is trying to push hard to have maybe one tool that can service many manufacturers mm-hmm. when it comes to this. Are we seeing that type of stuff with the, with the equipment manufacturers out there? We're starting to see the OEs think that way. So I think the equipment manufacturers were always putting out products that, could meet different criteria, but the work that the OE Roundtable is doing together has mm. people looking at specifications versus branding. Um, you know, there's still some of our Europeans that want to, you know, Audi, for instance, everything has to be bought through that VAS program that snap on manages for them. And, and there's specific brands in there. But you see more and more OEs going to spec, and Rivet Guns is, is one of those that's going to spec, mostly because it's, it's evolving. So I think the first real Rivet Gun that we kind of had to think about in this industry was when Ford came out with the aluminum truck. And that's really when everyone's awareness came. Sure. Our European body shops have been riveting for years before that. They kind of thought we'd all lost our mind when we started thinking about <laughs> riveting. But, but, you know, so there was, there was three tools then, three handheld tools, a lot of battery operated. And then now as the cars are evolving and more riveting is being used in repair by a variety of manufacturers that's coming into where multiple tools. And so, you know, I can buy the Express 900 rivet tool and that's going to fit BMW and it's going to fit Ford and it's going to fit all these other guys out there which is nice it saves the shop investment um, cool. we actually got Very stopped cool. by an OE chasing us down through the aisle <laughs> to stop really? to talk about riveting um, so you know one of the concerns is I may as an OE I may have nine or ten different rivets that are part of my repair procedure and those rivets are specific for how that rivet is shielded 
Um, and so it's very important that we're teaching shots. Okay, it's not just that you have the gun, you have the right rivet. And there's some aftermarket yeah. companies. You know, I don't want to say the clip lizard style kind of thing, but there's people that just says, oh, I can sell you bulk rivets. You don't have to buy them from the factory. And we have repair issues now coming back because it's the wrong rivet with the wrong shield on it. And it sure. don't got well, you know, it's, not, it's no different yeah. than to me. I, I make the, the relation to uh, nails, right? Yeah. There's many different types of nails when you're building a house or construction. Uh, and you have to use the right one depending on what, what operation you're doing. The same thing comes with the repair, right? Yeah. And you're doing a rivet. You can't just use the same, you know. So there's a there's a difference to the to what it's how it's designed, what it's made of, right? And and right. how it penetrates. And so that there's the manufacturer there's to manufacturer. Yeah, yeah, I may have a I may have a you know a six foot rivet that looks the same, but between Ford and General Motors, they are completely different. Don't use them cross brand. Well, that's that's awesome, Kristen. And so what I'm going to do right now is we're going to take a short break, and we'll return with Kristen in a minute to continue our conversation about SEMA. Solera Innovation Labs is a podcast produced by Solera, a global leader in data-driven solutions and services. Solera collects and translates complex data into actionable insights for automotive, identity, and property partners across 90 countries and counting. Learn more at solera.com or find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. All right, well, welcome back. We're we're joined here today with Kristen Fellner from Collision. I'm talking about SEMA and the events over at SEMA. So, Kristen, I know we've been talking a lot, a lot of things uh, about SEMA, and it sounds like you guys at Collision Hub, as well as the industry, had a, had a great show. One of the things I was going to ask you about is as we walked through the show, and I talked about it a little bit earlier, and I, I kind of want to bring it up because there's two things I really want to talk about before we, we sign off, and, and one of them is, is kind of the electric hot rods that are going on out there. And I don't know if you got over to that section. I didn't. Uh, as I, I said earlier, I wasn't able to get to the floor, but I was uh, doing a little bit of research before we got on today, and, and yep. Ford brought this lithium prototype. It's a Ford Mustang with 900 horsepower. So you, you look at it and go, oh, my gosh, it's, it's got double the, the typical uh, battery voltage yep. to get that horsepower. What was interesting about watching the video when they did the video at SEMA was that it's got a six-speed manual transmission. So I think one of the things I wanted to just ask you about, just from a, from a, a car enthusiast, a hot rod fan, whatever, is that when you go to the electrified hot rod, you get disconnected with the fact that you don't get manual transmissions. It's you know, it's usually a one or two speed transmission. And a lot of them, it's a single. Yeah, and it's all electronic. I mean, see, it's an electronic vehicle, so it's, it's you know, electronic shifting. It's, it's almost driverless in a way, right? You just hit a pedal and it goes. So, yeah. yeah. And you get yeah. instant power. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here in the back of my head. I showed it to my son, right, who drives the, the Subi. I talked about the Subi. And he's got the six-speed manual on we we're both kind of perplexed a little bit because you know, do you really have to shift at a at an RPM level? Because is there? But there's got to be right. There's got to be gears with the way they design this this motor. No? Yeah, I, you know, I I did walk through there because that kind of fascinates me, and I always that's you know obviously that's where the next gen is going to be, and and the evolution of hot riding and and performance and power and all that. And I get it, but I I don't connect to it. It's not gasoline and burning rubber, so I have a problem with it. <laughs> Well, you can burn I, I really rubber. Just, rubber. You can burn yeah, I rubber. just I really think that was Ford trying to pay homage almost more than it was a, an integral part of the design. I think that was just like one of the the cool factors of that is let's give it a six speed and make everybody turn their head sideways when they look at it. So, yeah. Well, that's true, you know. And I think uh, <laughs> they, they've even talked about and been in the news of late talking about doing a more of a like a Mustang station wagon type battery powered vehicle, right? So. Yeah, and there. our Europeans are pushing that. I mean, you've got you know, Porsche with their electrified four door, and you've got yeah. all this stuff coming out. And I think that's just Ford's trying to get in that game and be a player there too. So, so SEMA had a whole section on electric hot rods, and one of the things I thought was cool is you know you and I again you talk about gas and you know all that stuff, right? Being a hot rod, growing up that way. But I was just doing that research and looking at it. they took a, a 1962 Chevy pickup truck and put an E10 motor in it. So you can go buy an electronic crate motor now. Mm -hmm. So isn't that crazy? And think about that. Yeah. I mean, it's, I just, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm having, I know it's one of the things that I'm going to have to come to terms with in my life. Uh, but I just, uh, there's part of me that goes, well, how about the longevity of that? And, you know, how often do I have to charge that? How do I take an electric car on road trip? So I just stand there and stare at them and go pretty, but I have a million questions. Um, and I was just seeing a post, you know, Nick Brown at Tesla is a, is a really good friend and, you know, he, I get to play with those cars and he gets, you know, to drive some cool ones. But 
there was a, a road trip, you know, from Northern California to Southern California, and they have to stop off at charging stations along the way. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. It's just putting your head around it. I don't know. I'll get there well, one day. It, it, yeah, and it's kind of interesting. We, we did a whole show on EV vehicles, right? Uh, electronic wow. vehicles, and, and really t- kind of talking about that where people worry about how, how far can I go from a mileage perspective and where's the next charging station. You know, I, that yeah. being said, I, I, I watched the Top Gear the other day. I don't know if anyone watches those shows, but I, I enjoy those guys, especially the, the European or the, yeah. the British group that, that's doing it. They're, they're funny. But they took a bunch of electric vehicles and tried to drive across country with them and, and couldn't find places to charge them. They were asking restaurants and hotels if they could plug in and they have their own yeah, special yeah. chargers. And, you know, yeah. So now I look at it in a hot rod and, okay, I'm going to do a hot rod and for some reason, I don't look at doing a hot rod and saying I'm going to go get a get an electronic motor and stick it in here. Yeah, just, no, right. I, I mean, I, it's, that's the one thing I tell you that when I said it, there's something for everybody at Seaman. If you're not a car person, you'll find something worth looking at, and that's that's one of the things where somebody just pushes the limit. You know, we, one time we joked that we were going to try to put a supercharger on a Prius just to see if people would stop, right, <laughs> and, and catch it, but. Um, it's just, you know, it's one of those things, but, but the evolution for me, again, I'll just take it back to the collision route is hybrids or hybrids and or fully electric vehicles are not easy to fix. And there's, they present challenges such as battery storage. You have to remove the batteries when you're working on those cars. Um, lots of calibration when you're, when you're talking about those cars. And so, oh, yeah. you know, standing over there and looking at what's coming with electric vehicles makes me go, Oh, I can have this next evolution of knowledge that'll need to be brought to the closing industry. So yeah, well, you know, I'm not I'm out talking, of a job. That's for sure. No, no. And you know what, with the evolution of cars, you'll never will be right. Cause there's always yeah. going to be something new and unique. Uh, and, it, and it's just kind of interesting. So when you were uh, on the collision floor, one of the things you just mentioned, and it brings up the, another topic in my head, it'd be interesting for our, our listeners. Obviously, as we do these cars and the ADOS and all the computer equipment on there, you, you can't just disconnect the battery anymore and do your welding and what have you. You got to you got to make sure that it's still got power supplied to those units. And and there's a myriad of different ways. And you have to know what the charge is on that vehicle. So what what should it be? What's the current it should have versus because it's not just 12 volts anymore, right? Right. Some are 14, some are there. What type of things did you see at the uh, on the SEMA collision floor product wise for this? Is there is there one unit that can serve multiple? manufacturers do i need to have multiple you might tell me about that do you know yeah they're really what was really interesting is that's a gap on the floor there wasn't a whole lot out there dealing with that i think we're mm. still you know we're still trying to figure out just battery support for a regular 12 volt system when doing calibration right the art of removing those and caring for those products is still have to evolve and so as you go around and visit the people that specialize in storage whether it's you know innovative or goliath or those people that build products there's just they didn't they don't there's nothing there um mm-hmm. how do you store battery cells how do you you know if i, if I think about right. anything electronic that's 14 inches in a weld zone i'd better get that out of there that's a lot of stuff that's what, how do i store airbags how do i store sensors how do i store all of these things and do it well but that, that's kind of a gap and I, like, one of the concerns is that sometimes at SEMA there's the what what I need and I go looking for what I need and then there's the displays of what people think people want to buy and this year was a SEMA for me where there was a lot of stuff that was offered that was things that manufacturers thought people wanted to buy that they don't really need right now <laughs> yeah um, maybe it's a little early so, or premature to where it is in the, in the industry need yeah but the shops think they do and they'll spend money on it and so that's disheartening in a way I don't blame the manufacturers that's their job but it just means there's more responsibility I need to educate to, to help people not, right. you know, if we go back to the early stages of when, you know, OE repair information and OE certification programs came out, you'll hear shops tell stories of, hey, I went and bought a bunch of stuff I didn't need and they regret it. Yeah. I don't want to have that happen again. So there's, there's well. some stuff over there. And then there, I was walking around and so that was one of the things, I, I have a dealership group that we work with in Texas and we're struggling mm-hmm. with battery storage. You know, how do we can't, can't sit on the floor, right? And you don't want them to get yeah. run over and knocked or kicked. Do we need a new building just for battery storage and then that's way to store them and, and you know, can't just wrap yeah. them in plastic. A lot of, a lot of questions think? with, with batteries that are out there, especially with, you know, again, the electronic yeah. vehicles and, and really the, the ADOS systems and all the computer modules on these vehicles, you know, the old days of having one or two modules on a car are gone. Yeah. Well, <laughs> everybody wants it. You yeah. go on a car these days and the first thing a salesman tells you, I've been, I've been car shopping lately. Um, mm-hmm. I have two huge boys. I'm going to have to do a TV. No more sports cars for me. You go, and the first thing they want to show you when they open the doors is, let me show you how many phone chargers are in the car. Well, that takes power. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so 
that's a, that's a complete redesign of electricity and systems and cars just so we can have literally 12 phone chargers in an SUV. That's crazy. Well, they have one, one battery is going to be gone in a lot of these cars, but, uh, <laughs> So, so you know, we talk about electric vehicles. We talk a lot about uh, the things that are there. I'm, I'm kind of starting to wrap this up, and I want to talk about one of the really, what I think is one of the coolest things that SEMA does, because SEMA is filled with nothing but a ton of custom vehicles, be it wheels, uh, paint jobs, motors, in, interiors, all sorts of customization that's out there, right? And how do you really show it off when just sitting there? Because if you can't get into the show, you can't see this. But one of the things they did is they decided, and I don't know if it went back seven years ago or how long ago it went, but they decided to do a cruise night. So it's Friday night when they shut down the show, right, at the mm-hmm. close of the show. And it starts around 4 p.m. And, and how often do you get involved with this? Because, I mean, my understanding, and I, I did not get to see it this year because I had left town, but there's over a 1,000 vehicles that do this, Hello. what we'll call yeah. the, you know, the, the, the cruise, where everyone mm-hmm. gets to go see this. So even if you can't get into the show, you can set up and watch the cruise. Is that true? Yeah. And so it's, uh, and, and I think right in that five or six year range, when I first, I have to do this every year, which a lot of us weren't excited when SEMA did a, the SEMA Ignited event because that just prolonged our Friday. We weren't done at four o'clock like we thought we were. <laughs> um, but the locals used to line up on the streets and it was not a formalized parade and it grew bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And so I remember the first years of SEMA and doing productions with the TV shows and whatever, we were fighting those crowds. And I think SEMA wisely just said, hey, Let's just make a party of it and do a parade. Yeah. Um, so there are huge grandstands that are just packed with people and cars start to roll out and drive past the grandstands. Uh, everybody who's rolling out just to try to get to their trailer to load up and go home. And then a few cars go over to what is called the SEMA Ignited event. And that okay. has tripled in size just since that started. And that's where Battle of the Builders is announced. You know, Discovery yeah. Channel slash, you know, no longer Velocity, I guess, Motor Trends over there shooting their shows and doing a theme of special and all that. And then they do burnouts. So, so there's a center ring. I mean, it's, it's a celebration. It's an evening celebration of hot rod and car culture with the people that can't get into show. Getting into SEMA isn't easy. You, you must prove that you're in the industry. You must prove your employment, whether that's a pay stub or, you know, they double check and triple check who gets in and who doesn't. Oh, no, it's... And, it's- <laughs> it's like Fort Knox to get in. It's crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a huge event and it's a lot of fun. And we have to go there every year. We have customers we work with, whether it's the paint companies or three ends of the world, and they all have displays and booths over there or, or trying to get you know, one of the cars that we've put in a booth hauled over there for the night. And we're rigging up cars with cameras to do the drive or we're sitting in the back of them that's holding cool. the camera. That's cool. That's cool. So yeah. we'll, we'll look forward to somewhere on Collision Hub that you guys will uh, maybe show some of those cars in the parade or maybe a segment of it because it's going to be really interesting to take a look at. For those that can't get into the show, you can set up and take a look at all these custom vehicles kind of leaving as they do this cruise. Kristen, thank you again for your time thank today. You. you know, we appreciate it. And be sure to tune in to our next episode of Down Driving Drive In uh, on the Solera Innovation Lab. Thank you, everyone. Solera Innovation Labs is a podcast produced by Solera, a global leader in data-driven solutions and services. Solera collects and translates complex data into actionable insights for automotive, identity, and property partners across 90 countries and counting. Learn more at solera.com or find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.